Hello and welcome to Global Access. My name is Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator magazine. And I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Ricketts. We're going to talk about modern France and how its past explains its presence. Past and Present is the title of this year's edition of Global Access. Is it possible to draw conclusions from past events? Or is man doomed to repeat the mistakes of yesterday? How do authoritarian regimes use their own country's history to secure power? And what role does the individual play? In these interviews, researchers, journalists and writers try to answer these questions. Between the years 2012 and 2016, Lord Peter Ricketts was the ambassador for the UK to France. Speaking with Fraser Nelson, he explains how crucial events in the years 1940, 62 and 68 can help us to understand the French establishment's attitude towards the United States, NATO, Brexit and the Yellow Wests. Um, every country is explained to a certain extent by its past, some more than others. But you think that understanding what's going on right now with Emmanuel Macron and his struggles can be explained by three important points in France's recent history. Yes, I, mean, I wouldn't say the entire French policy can be explained by them, but like all old countries, like Britain, like Sweden, um, France has its ghosts to the past and they still walk in the corridors of power. Mm. Um, and I uh, look at it through three angles, really. One is the ghost of 1940 and the cataclysmic defeat and occupation of France. That has shaped uh, policy, mm. foreign policy, European policy since then. The ghost of 1962, and I use the um, uh, awful, difficult, traumatic history of French uh, decolonization from Algeria and the terrorism and violence that followed that as a way into talking about um, French sense of identity, mm. um, how they look on minority communities in France. And then the ghost of 1968, very familiar, the, the uh, riots revolution almost of 1968, has given the French political class a deep fear of street protest uh, and has contributed to the difficulty of reforming mm. France. Yeah, so three ghosts, all within 28 years of each other. Um, so let's talk about the first one, 1940. In what way, of course, every country in Europe is to some extent shaped by what's happened during the Second World War. But... The France has emerged from that war. Your argument is is a France that was quite keen to have a very big global presence. Yes, France had the uh, experience of occupation uh, and it had the providential man in Charles de Gaulle mm. who was uh, made it his life work, really, to overlay uh, and overcome um, that sense of national humiliation, to give France back its pride, but also to give it a narrative um, of how France, in fact, remained the free French during the war and it was the resistance and so on played a great part in it. And then, uh, in my view, uh, he designed French post-war policy, really, to ensure it could never happen again. Uh, so he uh, drew very close to Germany, and that's the origin of the uh, European Union, is in that Franco-German sense of determination never to allow that to happen again. Uh, but also it defined his approach to America. He was determined that France would stay sovereign and independent, um, would never again be dependent on another country for its security, uh, the adoption of the nuclear weapon deterrent, uh, French policy towards Russia as well, maintaining all through the Cold War a special line from Paris to Moscow, mm. um, just to be able to play a little bit of a, a mediating game between the two superpowers. And we can see that now in that France's defence spending is, along with Britain's, easily the highest in the European side of NATO. So, yeah. so, so can we see that? Because normally when there is a, a military expedition, France is normally first in line with a far better stocked aircraft. So that, you think, is still a response to 1940, where France is thinking right now that we want to make absolutely sure <clears throat> that our, our, our national fate doesn't depend on, I don't know, the, the magnificence of somebody on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, they don't, they've never been you know, completely um, uh, integrated into NATO. Um, they've always stayed a little bit distant. Now they are at least in the military structure of NATO, but for many years they were not in the military structure. 
Um, they've maintained, as you say, powerful um, uh, military forces. They are not shy about using them in the defense of French interests. And this all part of a concept that France is a major global player, fully deserving of its permanent seat in the Security Council, never again to find itself in, a, in this humiliating position, and a little bit more um, wary of uh, a close embrace with America, which has been the uh, traditional position of the UK. Since How does the this World explain War? France's position to, for example, the notion of, of an EU military? One of the tensions we've seen recently is whether you're going to still rely on NATO. As we all know, NATO is basically an American umbrella. Donald Trump quite often says, look, these Europeans aren't spending enough, so why do we bother? So can we see France thinking to itself, well, let us lead then um, a proper European military force? And I think that that is a big driver in French policy. The French approach the whole European Union issue in a different way from, say, mm -hmm. the Germans because they, they want to reconcile um, a very deep partnership with their neighbours with the maintenance of French national sovereignty and capacity to act. Uh, and those two things are always there in French thinking. And so when you look at European defence, yes, the French want a Europe that is more capable of using its military force, often on issues which will be French priorities, mm -hmm. um, and where the European role will be to come in behind the French and support and consolidate what the French have done. And when they use the word European strategic autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, or they talk about a European army, uh, I think it's both those things. It's Europe having uh, the capability, um, but expecting that France will be um, the driving force in deciding when and where and how it should be used. Well, let's talk about the ghost of 1962 then. Mm. In what way was this such a, a landmark in French history? I don't think France is yet fully reconciled to the very difficult, uh, bitter history of decolonization, particularly from Algeria. Uh, I mean, if you remember, there was a bitter um, civil war fought in Algeria leading up to the painful decision by de Gaulle in 1962 that France should, should leave Algeria, should give it its independence. But then it lingered on years afterwards, first with uh, far-right terrorism, um, including senior members of, ex-senior members of the armed forces, uh, and then in the 1990s, um, Islamic um, extremist terrorism from Algeria on the streets of Paris. And so the, the ghost of 1962 has lingered on in the security sense. I think it's given the French a deep wariness about um, uh, for many years about the, uh, the army and the trustworthiness of the army, and also a fear of uh, communities in France, distinct communities that were not integrating into, into the French model and that might pose a threat to French security. Right, but these isolated communities are still quite a big problem. I mean, we, we, we've seen the, the various riots in the Bon Louis um, a few years ago. We see the Muslim question now, which in France looms pretty large. Does it seem as if there's a solution being applied here? I mean, the, the interesting thing to me is the different approaches that Britain and France have taken. So in Britain, um, we have equally large um, communities, uh, mainly, many from the Commonwealth countries, and we've accepted diversity. Uh, we accept that police can wear turbans, uh, that you can have external symbols of your religious belief, um, and we've tolerated um, uh, large communities with their own cultures and traditions. Uh, and we use the word community for that. The French um, believe in integration, assimilation, that people coming to France should become French. And the word communitarism in French is, is a pejorative word. Right. It means something like segregation, right. uh, you know, almost ghettoization. Mm. And so there's been a very different approach. I don't think we can say that either approach has necessarily worked that mm. well. We've both had uh, homegrown radicalization, leading even to uh, terrorism from people who were born and brought up in our own countries. Uh, and so I think both countries are now thinking again about how you tackle radicalization and alienation in your minority communities. But we've come at it from very different angles. And I think the, uh, the bitter experience of 1962 is some of the reason to that. Right. And now the third ghost of 1968. Mm. Now, this, of course, you know, the, the, the were protests, student protests worldwide there, perhaps at their most spectacular in France. But hasn't French politics always been decided on the streets? 
Well, there is that deep uh, tradition in France, yeah. I mean, you can go back to the uh, revolution of 1789 and no doubt earlier than that in French history, that there's a propensity to go down into the street and protest uh, and stay protesting until you get your way and bringing France to a halt until you do. Mm. Um, and there's a, also a tradition of the countryside uh, rising up and rebelling against the Parisian metropolitan centre. Um, and uh, Le Gilets Jaunes. Is this part of a well, historical tradition? This is what I'm so, coming to. This is what yes. I'm coming to, exactly. Um, and so the current generation of French politicians, now now not my age and leaving politics, um, remembers 1968. Some of them might even have been participants. And the younger generation uh, have all been, you know, been told about 1968. And it's left a deep fear um, in, in the French establishment of losing control of the street and the government having to back down. Um, uh, when I was a junior diplomat in Paris 25 years ago, uh, in 1995, there was a massive um, general strike protesting against some reforms that uh, Prime Minister Juppé was trying to bring in, and it followed the classic pattern. The president gave way, caved in, sacked his prime minister, and the government uh, abandoned the reforms. That's been the tradition. I think it's interesting now to see that Macron, uh, President Emmanuel Macron, um, faced with a similar sort of thing getting going, this gilet jaune protest, mm -hmm. um, has essentially stood his ground. He's, he's gained, made some commitments. I think France came quite close to a genuine crisis around that time when there were very violent demonstrations, mm -hmm. damaged the Arc de Triomphe. There was a martial on. law at one stage. We were, we were very close to, to the classic tradition of having to mm -hmm. sack the prime minister, form a national government. You know. but, uh, but Macron stood his ground and is now recovering in the polls and has basically seen off the gilet jaune protest, as he saw off the protest by the train drivers um, yeah. the year before. So my question is, are we now finally seeing that ghost of 1968 laid um, by a French government that's prepared to stand up to street protest uh, and not be deflected, um, in, or not? Because I think at the moment, it looks like uh, we are, and that perhaps we can say that of the three ghosts, that one, um, the current uh, Macron administration, is in the process of laying that ghost in France, becoming a little bit less obsessed with uh, the risk of street protest. In recent European Parliament elections, the, um, we saw just how strong Madame Le Pen um, still is. I think she finished <coughs> just ahead of him in total share of the vote. She did. Now, to somebody looking on at France, you might think, well... This is rather alarming. You have a Le Pen here who's actually more popular <coughs> than the party of the president. So surely this represents a country which is still enthralled to populists as much as it's enthralled to this great radical centrist, Mr. Macron. Um, not unlike the UK, um, the European Parliament elections in France are the classic opportunity for protest votes. And the National Front does very well. And it did very well this time around. Actually, its vote was slightly lower this time than it was in 2014. Mm. But in the presidential elections, it still got a third of the vote, didn't it? Yeah, they did. She got, she got I mean, one that's third. pretty big. Uh, that, I mean, that measures pretty accurately, I think, the scale of the potential far-right vote in France, or, or right and far-right vote. Uh, it's around a third. Um, so it's big, but it's not capable, I think, of winning a majority. Um, Isn't this quite a combustible country, then, that has a third of the population voting for the National Front? Uh, yes, it, well, it is, potentially. Uh, it is effectively the opposition to the current president. Mm -hmm. um, both the classic parties of centre-right and centre-left are flat on their backs and giving no useful opposition. And well, um, why so is that? Why can they have so spectacularly failed to rejuvenate? Because the implosion of centre-right and centre-left is really quite remarkable. Well, it is. And, of course, it's, you know, it's parallel to some extent in, in elsewhere in Europe as well, where the centrist parties... Um, classic centrist parties have tended to be blindsided by populist movements. They're not quite right taken out in left. the way that the French ones <clears> have been taken <throat> out. Um, no, um, although, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the UK. Um, I think in the, in the case of France, um, Macron did something spectacular, which was to lead um, a radical movement from the centre. And he understood that both parties, uh, the socialists and the, and the centre-right, were very unpopular, were weak, were riven by um, struggle, personal struggles, corruption, various things. And he saw an opportunity, went through the centre, and he, he won power. And therefore, effectively, the, the far-right are his opposition. 
and they they got about 35%, as you say, in the um, presidential elections, and they got marginally less than in 2014 in the European Parliament elections. Nonetheless, they are a powerful force, and they are reflecting some of the things we've been talking about, um, the deep-seated concerns about immigration in France, mm. identity politics mm. in France, um, the years of high unemployment uh, and uh, a sense of alienation and grievance about um, uh, yeah, unequal spread of, of national wealth. Um, but Frank Macron, I think, is well placed to win again. Um, I think there is a natural majority in France for a centrist approach, um, but a strong um, grouping on the far right, which at the moment is, is completely in the hands of the National Front. I mean, if the centre right begin to you know, gain a bit more traction, of course, that vote will be split, uh, and that mm. will that will help Macron. But right now, um, yes, he's got one opposition. If Macron fails, um, mm. and for some reason, you know, he can't win the next election, then there must be a real risk of the National Front coming to power in France, and that is that should be a concern to everyone. Right. So that sounds to me <coughs> as if ghosts, rather than being put to rest, very much at large, the prospect of um, <laughs> President Le Pen, you're saying, is not not unthinkable. Um, and I'm trying to trying to work out why, given that uh, Macron has you know, quite identified the problems here, he's come up with an agenda which you think has got a good chance of of um, working on labour market reforms and pension reforms. You say he's got a parliament behind him, but he still seems quite close to failure that could lead to a really quite breathtaking um, change of power in France. So it seems to be, in many ways, a country still on the edge. I think that exaggerates it a bit. Um, as I say, I think the I think the natural plateau for the um, the right and the far right in France is is around that one third level, uh, which they scored in the in the presidential election, um, which still leaves the president with two thirds majority uh, at that point. And I don't see much prospect really that um, that and as I say, unless something catastrophic happens to Macron, we're going to face um, um, a national front government. But they are they are the most powerful opposition at the moment. France is a deeply divided country, uh, like so many others, like Britain uh, and many others around Europe, um, deeply impacted by um, the financial crisis, and the recession, high unemployment, immigration, um, and worried about its future. Um, but Macron, I would say, has had the courage to talk frankly. To people, and mm -hmm. um, he got elected not by evading the issue uh, and hiding, but by going out there and having endless town hall meetings, explaining relentlessly his program. He's come back from the gilet jaune problem by that same method, spending hours and hours and hours talking to citizens uh, and explaining what he's about. So I think he has got the best chance of anyone in France of realigning the forces and showing that France can reform. Mm -hmm. If he fails, then I agree, then I think um, there's a real risk that the National Front will capitalise on that. Now, Macron also <coughs> has ambitions in Europe. He's been giving his um, little manifestos on how to save Europe. At a time where German leadership is quite weak, do you think that um, he's likely to make progress in trying to get a handle on Europe? Because we're still, I mean, as we speak, there's quite passionate debates taking place about who's going to be the next President of the Commission, if it should be Monsieur Barnier, as Macron wants, or or, 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 a, or a German candidate. So, do you think that the ghost of 1940, in uh, as you put it, in so far as France is place in the world, might find an expression with greater or more visible French leadership in Europe? That will certainly be Macron's ambition. Yes, um, but I think. Um, uh, Europe is a long way from deciding what kind of power it wants to be in the world. And uh, assuming Britain does leave uh, the mm. EU in the next few months, uh, I think that question is sharpened. Um, because, um, I mean, very, making very gen generalisation, um, there is a French approach to uh, Europe's role in the world, which is um, an activist, um, international power, um, using its full weight um, politically as well as economically, and in security and defence terms as well, to, to play as a major, um, major factor in the world. I think there's what I might caricature as a German approach, which is for Europe to be a much more uh, a regional power block concerned with its neighbourhood, mm. uh, with its internal um, economic um, stability uh, and consolidation, and less interested in going out there and playing a role in this world of great power competition um, between America and China and so on. And I think that that's unreconciled. I think Macron is pretty clear and he's made clear that he has a rather ambitious and 
uh, a forward view of how Europe should develop, with a French president playing, yes, um, a central role, um, learning the lesson of 1940, um, but I don't think he's got by any means unanimity in Europe on that, um, or on these difficult issues of how to deal with um, you know, immigration and the tensions between the North and the South and, the, uh, and indeed the, you know, the different value sets that there are in the east of the continent. So, um, yes, there's a French programme. He's not getting much answer from the Germans, and they are a long way, I think, from having a consensus. That's going to be the task, really, of the next commission, the next president of the council uh, and the European leaders after Brexit, which is why you can see that they are quite um, uh, impatient now for Britain to leave uh, because there's a lot of other business for them to get on with. Interesting. So do you, th do you think that if it came down to it, um, Macron wouldn't mind a no-deal Brexit because, sure, it will hurt France a lot, but then again, they'll get rid of these pesky Brits. And it seems that in the last few months... Um, and Angela Merkel has been the one saying, look, let's go easy on the Brits, let's keep them. Or Macron is, he's the one who's playing bad cop. But partly because, I think, shorn of British um, interference in the EU, there's a far clearer path for him to be able to make what progress he thinks he'll be able to. I think part of it is that, is that President Macron likes to have a strong position out there uh, and to be you know, the one who is campaigning for a firm and, and, and decisive view. And so naturally he's led to say, well, if the Brits you know, can't make up their mind, then at the end of the day, they, we just need to get them out and carry on with the other uh, important things. But even the vast collateral damage on the north of France. Yeah, and that's why I don't think he wants a no deal. Uh, I think he'd much prefer there to be a deal. Um, but I think his patience now with endless British prevarication and uncertainty and continuing debate and deadlines put off and so on. I think his patience is wearing out more quickly than Merkel's. And mm. yes, at the limit, I think he would be willing to say, well, if the Brits can't make up their mind, then they need to leave and we need to get on with our you know, wider programme. And yes, of course, there'd be, there'd be an impact on, on the north of France. Uh, the the um, enormous passage of people and goods through Calais and the Eurotunnel at Folkestone is of huge interest to, to the French as well as to the British. Mm -hmm. But I think he would judge that um, the impact would be even more severe on the UK uh, and that it would at least clear the decks for France to be able to advance its agenda in Europe. So we cannot depend on Emmanuel Macron, I think, to be um, arguing for further delay mm -hmm. if we you know, don't have an answer on the 31st of October. Of course. Now, do you think Macron has been able to come up with a more of an answer about integration? As you say, it's vexed. France is vexed. Belgium is vexed. Britain is vexed. Most of Europe. Um, France has got its extra dimensions here with the North Africa connection. And there, France seems to be going a little bit further when it comes down to dress codes. Is there any signs of anything working yet? No, I, I don't think there is. I, I certainly don't think that the French approach of trying to make everyone a model French citizen and to ban signs of difference, uh, to put it like that, mm. uh, and to expect you know, conformist um, assimilation uh, has worked. Uh, and indeed, I think there's been some rethinking about you know, whether that's you know, been quite right. Um, but it's deeply sensitive still in France. Identity politics is a very, very powerful and toxic uh, weapon. Is that what's driving the National Front by large? Uh, yeah, I mean, very largely. I mean, the National Front actually came into being to represent um, the people who came back from Algeria in 1962, deeply, deeply alienated with France and the French government. That was where they started. And immigration and identity politics has always been their stock in trade, rather like Europe has been the stock in trade for Nigel Farage. Mm. Uh, it's been immigration and identity in France, and that's still there, uh, and they are no closer to having a solution. Uh, and they are very, very um, torn between uh, or torn on how to handle the issue of continued immigration into Europe, because on the one hand, of course, they want uh, the idea that Europe will shoulder the burden, mm. uh, share, you know, around different but countries. France hasn't shared that much but of the burden. For us, it's not or something. taken very many, exactly, and it would be very, very unpopular in France if they were to do so. So mm. they're walking a bit of a tightrope on, on immigration, um, and, of course, Germany has taken far more of uh, the immigrants, indeed Sweden has, than, than France has. Mm. So it's not easy for France to lead on immigration. Um, and equally, it's not easy for them to lead on some of the other issues that, that concern the, uh, the East Europeans, you know, about uh, um, you know, human rights and, and judicial freedoms and so on. Um, I mean, they want to maintain um, French influence across all those countries. 
Um, but equally, they can see that they are having a, a, an effect of pulling apart. Sometimes I think the French still long for a small group of, inner group of countries in Europe who share everything. Um, uh, the Schengen area, the Eurozone, values and so on. And uh, mm. you know, if some of these countries to the east you know, want to have a rather more distant approach with, with the EU, well, you know, we should find a way of letting them do that. That's always been in the French mind, and I think it still is. It's funny because Macron has proposed these various agendas for Europe now and again, the greater integration agenda, the idea of sharing budgets. And it seems that this has fallen flat and that his great antagonist Salvini <coughs> in Italy um, hasn't been afraid of, of biffing Macron. And it seems right now as if Salvini or rather the politics that he represents, is likely to make sure that Macronism makes no more progress outside of France. And, and of course, the issue that Salvini um, holds a grudge against France on is immigration, mm. because they feel that very much that over the Franco-Italian border, uh, France has not been allowing oh. these hundreds of thousands of, um, of migrants who've come into Italy. Perfectly and true, isn't it? They have a reason for thinking <laughs> that, exactly. Um, so he, I mean, from a populist direction, you know, Macron is his least favourite person, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the um, French agenda of uh, economic integration and external mm. projection of Europe is challenged by the populists in Italy, but also by uh, the Poles and the Hungarians and others. And as I was saying earlier, I think the Germans are not at all in the same position on no. how Europe should develop in the future. So, so that's a problem. I mean, even between the French and the Germans, they do not have a single approach to how to consolidate the Eurozone um, a single budget, sharing the risks of the Eurozone around. And they've got to resolve that. And that's far more important to France than uh, Brexit. And of course, even if um, Angela Merkel and others might agree with them, she's likely to get pushed back from public opinion in Germany. We get the Eurosceptic parties right over... When Eurosceptic insofar as they would like the balance of power to go more to nation states than to the centralizing vision that Macron has. Yeah. So is there a sense that Macron, incredibly impressive figure though he is, I mean, who else could come up, create a party from scratch, win the presidency with no apparatus, go and take the National Assembly? These things have seldom been done yeah. in our lifetime. So yeah. as a political entrepreneur, I think you don't have to admire Macron to say it is quite without president to have done what he, what he has done. Mm. But is there a sense that his the centrism he prescribes has come along about 20 years too late? <laughs> well, maybe. Um, but I think he would say uh, it's been a failure of previous French and other governments to sell Europe to the people. Uh, and one of the problems we have now is because people have not understood you know, why we need Europe, what, what's at issue here, what's Europe trying to achieve. And to give him credit, he has really tried to go out and sell a positive message about Europe. And is it working? Are there any signs that people are beginning to come around to his way of seeing Europe? Well, you know, it's, uh, I think it is interesting to see, for example, in Greece. I mean, Greece went through uh, the most terrible uh, wrenching uh, adjustments uh, after the crisis in 2011. There was a time when people thought that, that Germany and France would chuck Greece out of the Eurozone. They didn't. Greece is now you know, recovering, uh, and the support for the European idea in Greece is still very strong, uh, as it is in Spain. Um, as it is in Portugal. And you know, in many countries, I mean, if you ask about um, how do you think about the current European Commission or Mr. Juncker or, or President Tusk, you get a pretty negative answer. But if you mm -hmm. ask them about, you know, is Europe a good thing? You know, should our country be in the European Union? You get pretty strong positives. And so I think there is a, there's more of a, um, a, kind of, uh, a well of support for the idea of being in Europe in many of the uh, current European countries than, than we would accept in the UK. And Macron is playing to that. And the, from what I saw when I was in ambassador in France, the younger generation in France are more pro-European probably than uh, the generation of their parents. Mm. Um, they've benefited from Erasmus. They've benefited from freedom of movement around. They can go work anywhere they want to. And by and large, the younger people, it's a big generalization, but a, a good sway that the young people are positive about the, Europe. So I think Macron feels he's got a case to sell. And there is a receptivity out there. But of course, it's by no means a done deal. And the older generation uh, voting National Front um, are resolutely anti-Europe, as indeed many are in the UK. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure.